everybody. Thanks for joining me for another One Man Review. Today I'm going to be taking a look specifically at uh, Kevin Huizinga's Glenn Ganges in the River at Night book. But I have a I have a whole bunch of his other work. I've brought a cu couple other ones here because I'm going to show a few things in them um, because I, I don't want to give a full artist overview. I got a lot of Kevin's stuff from his website and it's very complex work and pretty hard to digest, at least for me. Not not uh, any flaw on Kevin's part. He's 100% do doing exactly what he's intending to do. And I'll talk about that more. It's just, I think this is the explaining why, like this is the key to me to understanding his work. And I think it's what was for me the most palatable version of what he's doing. Uh, I, I went out and bought all of his stuff that I could get from his website, thanks to a recommendation from Alex Nall, and, and intended to do like a artist overview of all the things I could get. And the, A, the work is really dense, and it would be a long video, which I don't mind. But B, I did struggle with reading a lot of it. And I think Kevin is a phenomenal cartoonist who's doing something really interesting. It's just something that's very hard for me personally to consume. And I so because I really like and I'm impressed by and respect what he's doing, I didn't want to do like a negative review. I don't I don't like doing negative reviews. So if I get something out, I don't like it. Usually I just don't talk about it. unless it's like like Monica, where it was a you know big release and it's Dan Klaus and everyone's talking about it. Then, yeah, of course, I'm going to give my review on that. So I, I am going to come back to these two books, Gloriana and the Wild Kingdom, and point out some of the things that turned me personally off of the rest of his work. And, but I want to focus on Glenn Ganges' The River at Night because I feel like this is a real masterpiece and it kind of explains my thesis on what Kevin Hazinga is doing in all of his work, which, and again, I think his general project is really fascinating and he's a phenomenal cartoonist. So this has a really cool fold out cover here. I don't usually keep dust jackets, but I'm gonna keep this one. But also a beautiful design on the inside. This is this is put out from Drawn and Quarterly. It's a collection of six issues of the, I think the book was called G, and then this is a collection of them. So he put them out, uh, I think by himself, maybe Drawn Quarterly put them out, and then this is the collected version from 2019. So Glenn Ganges in the river at night. Glenn Ganges is the kind of stock character that Kevin uses in all of his stories, which was because uh, I was saving this one because it's like the big, nice looking one. I was kind of saving this as the last one I, to read. I wish I had read this first, maybe. But uh, I was a little confused in his work because this Glenn Ganges character just started showing up in all these different places in different situations in, uh, you know, like tributes to other people's work. I just didn't quite understand for a while that he's using this as like an everyman character, I think, is what's going on. So this is Glenn Ganges. I'm also thinking that Glenn Ganges is in, in some regard a kind of fill in autobiography character for Kevin Hazinga as well. Cause it's really hard for me to imagine that the way that Glenn Ganges mind works in this book is not what's going on inside of Kevin Hazinga's head because this is what's going on in all of his work. Uh, and I'll continue to explain that as we talk more about the book, but you can see this opening sequence, just some really beautiful imagery Really amazing cartooning, great coloring. It's on this nice creamy paper, just phenomenal production all throughout. And it's just this pullback where you're going from someone's living room to the world at large. And that to me is the perfect opening statement for what Kevin Hazinga's work overall is is he seems to be, and I've always associated this with James Joyce, and James Joyce, is uh, my response is kind of the same. Uh, my understanding of James Joyce is that the, the core concept of his work is you can freeze like any one thing, any one moment of time, any one activity, and free associate the rest of existence from that one point. 
And in that sense, like all things exist in everything. The possibility to mentally get to thinking about anything is contained in one thing just by free association. So I could see like a blue marble and immediately think like the color blue, the, the show Blue's Clues, Superman has blue on his chest, Superman fights Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor's bald, uh, I could go from Marvels to Michelangelo, right? I could just do that like six degrees of separation with words. And I, I think that's my opinion of what Joyce is. Once I get that trick, then I find Joyce to be tedious. And that's a little bit of what I personally had a hard time reading most of Kevin's other work is it just seems too nonlinear, it, like jumping all over the place. And it seems like that's how his head works, is that he's just constantly seeing the associations between everything and that it leaves him very, very distressed and restless, which is the story of this. So we have Glenn Ganges going through his day and he's going to go home and try and go to sleep. And the whole book is one night where his mind is just going bananas, free associating every which way from your living room to the universe, as that opening sequence shows. And just throwing out every thought that comes along his way onto the page with, I mean, just uh, cartooning chops that are insane. Um, but showing like that insomniac state. And I think why it's so uncomfortable for me to read is my brain does that too. <laughs> and I don't need to like go into someone else's crazy brain. I felt very anxious and stressed and irritated while I was reading the other works. This one, because it was put in the context of trying to go to sleep, I could ride with it longer as like, yeah, this is the perfect, like, you have summarized this and put it on the page in a way I didn't even think was possible. And so I could roll with this book without getting as frustrated um, for, for longer. But so just really, like, beautiful cartooning here. Glenn Ganges is walking home over the same, like, way. And this is just two, two years ago, two years ago, three years ago. And he's mentally like mapping his memories onto the walk. And I just love the formalism of how the panels interact here as he's walking through these like pains of time. I think that's one of Kevin Hazinga's real strengths is he can figure out how to show very complex concepts pretty easily with cartooning. This is something I, since working on Strange Death, I've really wanted to try thinking about the space of a comic page as a, also having a Y axis that goes back and he's playing with that there a little bit, which is a really, really cool technique. Uh, here is another really fun technique where Glenn Ganges basically is entering his own head. Like he's remembering himself thinking what a mess should I buy a new bicycle? Wendy's trip to Japan? What if? And then he's like occupying that time. And he says, did I just time travel? Um, and the way that's represented here formally is just so, so clever. So that's the strength of Kevin Huizinga. He's really amazing at that. Um, whether I would recommend his work to you or not is if you can handle someone whose brain is on constant squirrel, squirrel, like just all over the place. And this is perfectly represented here where he's got like a three track mind almost. This is Glenn Ganges' wife. I don't know if Kevin Hazinga's partner, wife, girlfriend at the time he made this is also a cartoonist or not. But this is a character that she's illustrating that's being turned into a video game. So you kind of have this track here where it's what she's working on. And then you have them communicating and him going off and doing his own thing. And then you have like uh, this song playing in the background as well that has uh, something to do with the content. Like this kicked off for him, this thought process, and then something about an archbishop. So you have like all this different mental tracks going on on the page at the same time. And you kind of got to bring them together, which sometimes like on this page is really fun and interesting. But I think in a total, uh, it just burnt me out and me like, but, but also like this was the last book I read and I was able to enjoy this one the most. Some other cool formal stuff is just to create these separate tracks. 
he has linked these two panels together by putting this extra piece of caption tying them together and not having a gap. So he's using some Gestalt grouping properties in there, which is really interesting and, and something um, that I, I wish I would have thought about earlier in my comics. Those properties applied to comics, those principles applied to comics. So now we've got to the point where we've got the introduction to the character. We've met his wife. We've met his situation that he's in. They're getting ready to go to sleep. She's already kind of asleep. And he's going in like, oh man, it's late. I should, I should go to bed. And immediately gets in and is like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Sleeping. What are you sleeping about? Uh, do you want to go get a sound check? Really? Like I would, I would slap him uh, if if someone came into the room and woke me up. But you, you could see that just like mind on fire already there. And then the rest of the night is Glenn Ganges trying to go to sleep. And his mind is just going bananas. And you could see here, he's like thinking about Cro-Magnon sleeping together. All the other, maybe this is them getting older. People in Japan. Uh, all these heads on all of these pillows. And then they make like this little bow form. And he gets like a cellular structure out of that with all the little talking. And I mean, immediately goes from sleeping in bed to this universal geometry kind of thing in one page. And it's just, I mean, yeah, it's, it's so well done. Then you'll get these really odd, really amazing looking things where he's going into the world of the Glenn Ganges's uh, wife or partner's world here of her graphic novels that's being turned into a video game really like these characters would totally read a whole book of this all on its own feels kind of michael deforgy in a sense this is another really cool use of the word balloon where it's almost like he's trying to think about himself falling asleep but it also just reads like panels and then he's like ah this this isn't working but this is like what he's doing mentally um, the book's chock full of this kind of stuff. I'm just pulling out the, the ones I really like. Here's another really good example of the comic page as having a Y axis. We did do a little bit of this in Strange Death, and in my section I tried to push it a little further because I really liked that concept. Uh, Dave was the first person I could think of that did that, but it looks like uh, Kevin Hazinga was up to that on his own as well. I just hadn't seen it. And then having all of these like little tiny panels that are slowly getting better. This is also cool because you don't really get any of the dialogue or anything. So he, he's representing his life to himself as a set of memories. And Kevin Hazinga is picking up on the way that comics can hold, uh, again, like a gestalt kind of, you, you, you can take in the whole page at once. So you're taking in multiple m moments, but you could see them as a totality of interrelations and that is my experience of how my thoughts and uh, memories work as it goes so fast it feels like you're kind of seeing it all at once and to have that I think is is really really smart on the comics page there's I mean you could just see the compositions here are really really uh, crazy and really really awesome he references a book called Method and Being, which um, seems really interesting to me. I'm gonna, there was a lot, he, he's definitely referencing a lot of literature and other things. Like here's the Jean-Luc Heligra Method and Being later writings. Um, so he he's definitely, Kevin is definitely a reader and a philosopher and is philosophizing a bit in comics. He has a very particular interest in the combination of space and time. I think uh, there there seems to be with method and being. I have, I have read the book, but the way it's showing up in here, it seems Heideggerian in some sense related to Heidegger's ideas of uh, being and time and time and space and those those kind of ideas. I'm also getting some. Um, ah, I'm going to blank on the name. I'm not going to even try. It. There's another philosopher I'm thinking about who deals with the collapse of space. Uh, Andre Bergson. This feels like Bergson a little bit as as well. Here is some other really cool where he's taking like the space time grid and talking about like, you know, how do we uh, make a detailed calendar that could like fit days, minutes, months? How would you lay it all out? 
how would you carve it up? Um, then he's dimensionalizing it. So you, you can see again that this has to be, for Kevin Hazinga to be able to represent these things on page, this has got to be what's going on in his head. And that's what made the work hard for me ultimately is it was just very distressing for me to be inside of the head of someone whose brain is working like this. Like my brain can do it on its own. It's sometimes very exciting, oftentimes uncomfortable and pleasant. When it's someone else's brain doing it, I found it very unpleasant. Uh, it was too unstructured. But in this book, the unstructuredness is the point and it is telling a story. I feel like in his other works, it's just all the jumping with none of the larger statement about that mindset. It's just someone working in that mindset instead of talking about it. That's why I found this Glenn Ganges book more approachable for me in particular is having that narrative structure to show what it's like to have a mind like this made it approachable. Whereas the other works which I'm going to talk about in a minute or so didn't seem to acknowledge what was going on there just a, a lot of other cool imagery that's going on here you can see he's trying to explain a lot of like different concepts here's a sharp focus versus blurry a lens metaphor and a, a filter metaphor and he's saying it wasn't just common sense or pure science Hutton thought differently than scientists today. He was looking at the layers of rock through layers of lenses or filters of his own perception. Of course, everyone does. Uh, here he's he's talking about basically geology and how the, the world is formed. So he's a voracious uh, kind of reader of science and other things too and often wants to explain the cool things that he's found out about the world, which to me, um, again, if it's not put in this larger structure, can get a bit tiresome interesting but the especially in the way he's represented it all but it, it kind of wore me out and just again some of these these things like this but i this is really interesting to me that he's he's trying to in this panel i think despatialize our interactions with reality in the sense that it, instead of like shifting your perspective which is very three-dimensional to talk about what perspective are you looking at the world from. And it's something I've always struggled with in trying to explain a lot of the philosophical concepts I'm very interested in. The best metaphor I've come up with is this same metaphor instead of spatializing things. I mean, you still have to imagine spatial motion, but you can think about just swapping filters and that becomes less spatial that our senses are filters and you can change your filters. That's also, I think, a pretty Heideggerian thought that your world is based on the how you're at any moment feeling and that, that that changes your filters. Like a bright sunny day could look like this is the most beautiful day or like you're not paying attention at all depending on your mood. So I really like this representation of filters and lenses being being put up as a metaphor for understanding the world. Here's just some more really cool visuals. Again, really trying to play with this idea of um, everything kind of all existing at once and your access to that being both spatial and non-spatial, trying to get outside of those boundaries, uh, zooming in and out. The, the very, I think it was that uh, it's a Mies van der Rohe's video, I think, but it's very Carl Sagan-y where it's a couple laying on the grass and then it zooms out to the universe and then to cells and back to the couple. Uh, that kind of looped nature of reality, that's the James Joyce thing I'm talking about as well. And that's, that's here where like his one moment fits into that larger map, which makes this ocean and then creates this like sediment kind of here he's playing with sedimentary things but also talking about it as like time and this i mean this is just a stun such a stunning visual of like geological time as all one thing like looping back forever but it all exists and again is playing with comics as a three-dimensional thing where you can go on that y-axis and pile your panels on top in space is a really cool idea and a gorgeous visual interesting concept 
I mean, here he's doing that same thing where because of how he's using the, the transparencies, you're seeing this thing from all sides at once, really. It's a really cool illusion. And again, it's almost like a holographic view of reality where everything, like all of the three-dimensional information is encoded in a two-dimensional surface, which I think is exactly the right way to think about reality. That's the theory I'm pumping for. So there's a lot of good visual representations of that in here. Uh, this is just another composition I really like where you've got Glenn Ganges in the Hall of Mirrors of Nature. You've got all these recursive panels in here. You've got him coming outside of panel borders. You've got all these perspective changes um, happening in the same way. Again, treating the page as like a three-dimensional space with the Y-axis. Uh, just gorgeous compositions. I will admit that by the time I got to the sixth chapter of the book, I was pretty burnt out, and it was the same thing that I have when I've tried to read Ulysses and James Joyce's stuff, is it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I've, I've got the point now. <laughs> I, I get it, and I'm, I'm tired. You're wearing me out. Um, I'm ready to go to bed. And so I, I did have trouble uh, finishing reading this last part, but, so I was skimming through the last chapter because it's like, okay, we know he's finally going to get it together and fall asleep but really really love this visual here of like the line so you're kind of getting one dimension and then it opens up and becomes more two-dimensional and then you get like a three-dimensional kind of layer here and then here he steps out of the panel so as the page gets its y-axis it becomes a representation of fourth dimensional time uh like like this is a two-dimensional representation of one dimension it, this is a two-dimensional representation of three dimensions and then even though this is still two-dimensional representation you're kind of going from three to this removed fourth as much as you can in a two-dimensional space and again that's that holographic kind of idea of you can you can represent higher dimensions and lower dimensions to to some extent and he's doing a really good job of that this is another one of those just amazing you know, time de decompressed and put all onto one page together images. Uh, really, really love it. This Hall of Mirrors, but it's also a skating rink going into this spiral. Um, yeah, I could just go on about the visuals in this book all day. But it, it is, you know, uh, in the end, something that I can't say I enjoyed reading. I was in awe of it. Uh, I was impressed by it. And I was 100% like, yes, this artist is out to do this specific thing. I know exactly what he's out to do based on the work, which is always what I'm looking for in art is like, is it obvious what they were, not necessarily obvious, but is what I think the artist is trying to say accentuated by what they're doing in the work? And in this case, yes, I think Kevin Hazinga is doing exactly what he set out to do. It's extremely impressive. I would actually recommend the book. I think everyone should read it. It's just such an impressive piece of comics. But I didn't like it. You know, I, I just, like I've said before, it, it just wore me out. That all being said, that understanding of what his work is about then was able to like retroactively make me have a little bit kinder opinion of the stuff that I had read earlier in the evening or the previous day. You know, I read these things over a couple days and I'll, I'll point out why these works. I was like, what in the fuck? This guy is a great cartoonist, but I have no goddamn clue what he's up to. This is just a mad, mad person. So this book here, Gloriana, it's kind of a collection of some short stories you get Glenn Gangy in this as well. You have some of these little diagrams and whatnot. But what you get in here is this same just kind of jumping from topic to topic, jumping from character to character. And you think you kind of know what the story is about, and then it heads another way. You get these things where they break down into these weird cartoonings. Actually, I, I did really like this sequence in this book. I think this is the first time where I really kind of understood what Kevin Hazinga is up to. And I really, again, like the composition and the rendering here. But this is, I had been really frustrated reading the work. And I got to this fold out, which is beautiful and amazing as a piece of composition. 
And I said, yeah, this is why I'm not enjoying this experience is, is Kevin Hazinga's brain looks like this. <laughs> like, this is a drawing. This is what I feel like I've been reading. And I just am overwhelmed by it. And that that actually calmed me down a little bit because it's like, okay, like, this isn't just someone who has no idea, like, a great cartoonist, but, like, just has no idea how to tell a story. It's like, okay, that's that's what this guy's up to is just this chaos. You know, he's trying to represent the chaos a brain can exist in when it's always jumping from one thing to another. Uh, this one, especially the Wild Kingdom, that extends to how the book is formatted and it became extra just nuts to me. Like, I don't know what this is about. But it, on the back, it says that this explains the dramatic story of how the earth reshapes it. It's a clear, comprehensive text and vis illustrations. This book is ideal as a reference and perfect for browsing to. Here's the exciting exploration of our dynamic world and its remarkableness. And here it just has like deft science for children. The illustrations alone are worth dot, 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 dot looking at. So these are all like fake outstanding in the sense that it stands out comics appraisal throughout the book runs the love and understanding often felt by humankind for the world of animals road construction lawyer digest so like he knows that this book is a fucking mess and is playing with that on the back and as a reader it's like yeah why um there's these weird like cut and paste things so it like the cover the way it's selling itself is that this is almost going to be like a uh, uh, like a science illustration book that's going to teach you something about the world and geology and biology and all of this stuff, but it's not. There's also this thing here that says, author's note, the most technical parts of this book are concentrated towards the beginning. Readers who are not, whose interest is not held by these passages, who are eager to read about the current crisis we are facing today in the Wild Kingdom and who just enjoy jumping about should feel free to skip forward. To help these non-linear readers, the more technical ideas introduced early on are also defined in a glossary at the end. Uh, non-linear is right, but there's no <laughs> there's no gloss. Oh yeah, there is. There's an index. But none of the stuff that's in this index I don't think is in the book. And it's got page numbers. There's no page numbers in here. So this is an index and bibliography. It's a fucking mess of arrangement. And then I don't think any of these things are actually referenced in the book. And if they are, they've got page numbers, which aren't helpful. And I don't know that there's even that many pages. So it's like, what the hell? And then you get a table of contents, again, with page numbers. I don't even know that there's that many pages in the book. You can't tell what page anything is because there aren't page numbers. And then when you start reading it, it's like, okay, page three. So I'm assuming this, that's three, four, five, six seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So this would be page 14. And apparently that's where life and its marvels start. But there's a break here where this is Glenn Ganges and Wild Kingdom, which is just this book. So I don't know if like what exactly these don't seem to line up to any actual breaks in the book. They don't seem to represent any of the contents at all. It's just totally, it's total nonsense. It's like misleading nonsense. And then the book is like that. It just kind of jumps this Glenn Gangy character around uh, like different weird experiences. There's no real narrative context. We're switching from color to black and white. It's got nothing really to do with animals or the wild kingdom or how the world works. You're getting like our biggest sale of the year and then famous ghost and then treats from the orchard which is like photographs of apples that have just had like tracing put around them and a filter on them um uncle animal it's just this endless flow of like unrelated stuff and then like he's talking about in the in the intro saying that all the technical stuff is at the beginning of the book at the beginning of the book is like a guy walking around, looking at his chest, hardly any words happening. And then as you get to the back of the book, 
you start getting these denser pages with more information or it seems to finally be about the wild kingdom where he's telling you something about what types of pigeons they are and giving you some details and telling you about this book, The Life of Pigeons by Maurice Maeterlinck. Um, you know, some charts like this, which are really interesting, but again, like just like, what the hell is he saying? Like we're going from single cell organisms to an eye, a multi-cell organism to an ichthys fish with a cross and a zero and a D. And then that becomes Dan the fish. And this is Darwin window, you know, and then this is like we get out of the water and we're fresh, freshwater animals. And then like the Ixus shows up on cars. Like it, this is a good representation of that kind of just free associative thing. And, uh, you know, I don't know what any of it means. I don't know anyone could know what any of it means. Uh, he's got all of this ability to make these sensible graphs and communicate really complex ideas that shows up in other places. But, you know, like this, I guess this is maybe referencing adding a, a y-axis if only we could work in three dimensions. And uh, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know what I'm being shown. And that's how I felt reading all of his other work is I was just... Like, none of this adds up. None of this makes sense to me. The table of contents is off. The Everything on the back is fake. It's not a field guide. It's hardly about the wild kingdom at all. You know no one's going to like it. You're writing that into your... You're they're like, oh, you know, like, we couldn't get any poll quotes because everyone's just like, I don't know, man, it's a fucking mess. And so, like, they're putting fake... I, I just... That's how the rest of the work worked for me. I, I don't know. I, I've heard plenty of people mention Kevin Hazinga's name. There's probably, I had seen something like this earlier, which is why I'd never bought his stuff. But in the conversation with Alex, he had, he'd give me a bunch of names and I was enjoying everything. Uh, but yeah, I just really did not enjoy reading the majority of Kevin Hazinga's work. But once I read, once I saw the spread from Gloriana, started getting an idea of what he was doing. And once I read Glenn Ganges in the river at night, I realized, okay, this isn't just a mad person. It's someone who is doing exactly what they want to do. They're doing it very well. It's just not a project that I personally like because it stresses me out. Um, it's just too far off from what I want. So I'm going to put this out there as like, definitely recommend getting the river at night and read it. It's, um, it's just a real like masterpiece of comics, cartooning, formalisms, all that stuff. I personally can't recommend the rest of the work, but if you like nonlinear things, if you like that view of the world, then I can't imagine anyone doing that better in comics format than Kevin Hazinga. And I would put him as like, veer, not, not all the way James Joyce yet, but veering towards... Uh, like the closest we have that I know of in comics to a James Joyce figure, which is, you know, that's a, a, a hell of a compliment, even though I will never finish reading Ulysses and I wouldn't even read the first page of Finnegan's Wake. Um, there's a reason those works are valued. And I think there's a reason these works should be valued as well. So please check them out and make up your own mind. Those of you who have read this stuff before, um, I'd love to hear what you think. And those of you who are fans of Kevin Hazinga, I'd love to hear why, what it is that appeals to you about this type of project. Plaza by Yokoyama Uichi. Uh, this is translated by Ryan Holmberg and is a very large for a manga. So that's a really cool feature of this book, this standard manga size. And it, it, this is just a 200 some odd page um, representation of what Yokoyama Yuichi thinks of the carnival parade and he's just made this like relentlessly loud and rhythmic book that pushes all kinds of amazing boundaries of what comics and manga are and we could not recommend this book more make sure to like smash that subscribe button and ring that bell